Yo, yo, welcome everyone to Weird Growth, the podcast where we hear about the strange and often unpredictable journeys that founders take. This episode, we have Derek Markwell from Robo Rigger, which makes robots, which makes cranes safer, uh, and has won more innovation awards that you can probably poke a stick at, um, all while literally stopping cranes from killing people. It's a pretty amazing thing that you've done there, Derek. Thank you so much for being on Weird Growth. Thanks for having me, Cam. Please, can you introduce yourself um, and let everyone know how you have come to know and do what you do? Well, I'm a civil engineer, uh, which is just what you should be to develop robotics. Right. Very good at reinforced concrete, structural steel design. (laughs) Um, But I was a tinkerer. I've always been a tinkerer. Okay. Uh, with electronics yep. um, and building things, building boats, building the house and all that sort of thing. So it all comes together. Um, so civil engineer, I started yep. out working doing uh, buildings, um, water treatment plants, really? all that sort of stuff. Yep. Um, then went overseas, worked in the oil and gas industry, came back, um, worked for a company called Wallahan Grill, which became Wally. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. uh, so doing oil and gas work, came over to Western Australia doing offshore platforms, then joined Wapit, which is Chevron, Okay, um, and was responsible for developing uh, five offshore projects, and then I became Chief Facilities Engineer for Chevron, um, and then in 97 decided I wanted to do my own thing, mm-hmm. and that stage um, set up a company called Icon Engineering, and... Is that Icon Engineering that's still running today? Still running, yeah. Wow, yeah. okay. Yeah, so it started out with two other partners. Yep. And we went for about 11 years, and then I had some ideas I wanted to do before I died. Yep. Um, and so in 2009, I sold out to the partners um, and started up Tensor Equipment. Yep. And so Tensor was focused on equipment and coming up with some ideas that I had to try and uh, pursue them and see if they'd turn into products. And at the same time, I also was a founder of Hydra Energy, which was a startup oil and gas company. Amazing. So, you know, I wanted to do these things. I'd been wanting to do these things and, uh, you know, this was the opportunity. Yeah. So 2009 for Tensor. Um, and we've been doing lifting equipment for the offshore oil and gas industry uh, and the drilling industry. <laughs> and this just evolved, you know, um, we, we did some electronics and software mm-hmm. for motion monitoring. and um, That's a massive amount of – that's a, a very, you know, varied career in a lot of ways as far as engineering goes, I suppose. Yeah, it's a great benefit because yeah. when you start to do robotics, um, not only do we know how to do the ro- – well, actually we don't know how to do the robotics, to tell the <laughs> truth. But Figure we, it out. But we're experts at how to use them. Okay. Yeah. So I've been on the end of offshore construction, lifting and cranes and design like that. So I've come from the user background rather mm. than from necessarily from the uh, here's a robot, how can I actually do something with it background. Love it. Get stuck into the robotics and stuff in a, in a minute. I'm really keen to hear more about mm. that. I'm sure everyone else is. But before we do, have a little pop quiz for you. Something that we uh, that we that we do on weird growth, and it's mm. it's, a, it's an easy one, but. Also a big question, if you were to start from scratch today and start a brand new business, what would it be and who would you be helping? Um, it'd be green energy. Okay, yep. Um, we've got to do something about it. You know, I look at it as Australia or particularly Western Australia where the sunniest, windiest place in the world <laughs> yeah. pretty much and, uh, and we really are still using coal yep. and we don't have a plan in place to go green. So that's what I'd be doing. Yep. And, and I've got some plans, you know. I've got some ideas in my back pocket. Yeah, a super topical there. issue, obviously. And, um, you know, we probably won't get into too much detail, but there are so many opportunities and there's not one uh, coherent vision, I suppose. It's especially well, in Western Australia, at least, there's a lot of different thing, ideas, but there's not one sort of clear idea of where to go. No, you start with a target. Yeah. And then you put a vision together around the target. I don't think we've got a target, have we? No. No. So, so, yeah, okay. That's right. And, and it's a no-brainer that, you know, the whole world's going that way. We've mm. got to go that way. And, um, yeah, it's uh, it, the opportunities are there, but yep. they're not being explored at the moment. 
Yep. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. So you're an engineer, but you're also a successful businessman as well. And you found, you know, you just told us, how, you know, you started a lot of businesses, um, you know, two engineering firms and things. How... How do you see yourself as an engineer first or as a business person first? Definitely as an engineer first. <laughs> yeah. I love engineering. Yeah. Um, and it's probably why I'll never retire because I just enjoy doing it so much. What is it about it that you enjoy? Um, the technical challenge, you know, there's nothing like having a problem that you can solve mm. and the, the satisfaction of solving something. Even when we're developing RoboRigger, you know, something doesn't work and... Uh, Probably the most satisfying. Everyone's scratching their head, and you go, "Uh huh, I think it could be this." And you know, it just unlocks the solution. You unlock a solution yeah, because yeah, that's of pretty cool. Some sort of process. I don't know what it is, but um, I find that I can sort of think through, and probably I've got a breadth of experience. So it's it's looking at a lot of different things and being able to feed all that information in yeah. to develop an answer. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I can see that meant like that. Not everyone has that type of brain and, and mm. you see that with programmers and things as well. Sometimes the pursuit of solving the problem is the thing which really motivates them and then once they've done that, it's on to the next thing. It's not mm. necessarily... And so in marketing, you know, we're about solving problems as well but maybe from more cr creative angles and mm. things and when it works, it's just a great feeling. It's very satisfying. But the business problem yeah. is also an interesting problem as well. So sure. I actually really enjoy the business side. Yeah. I do not enjoy the drudgery of... Um, tax returns and <laughs> accountancy and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, that's what Peter Drucker says. There's really only two things which create value in a business. It's innovation and marketing. Mm. Uh, and everything else is an expense. So, you know, those two things combined can be, you know, is what actually mm. generates value in, in business. Uh, that's really cool. So how did you first discover the problem that you're solving with Robo Rigger? Where did you sort of see that initially? Um. Probably four beers into the... I'm assuming you were on a work site at the time. The, the, the afters at Offshore North Sea. Right. So it was a uh, oil and gas conference in Aberdeen. Yeah. And I was actually talking to the CEO of a company called Seajax, which was at that time, and probably still is, the largest installer of offshore wind turbines right. in North Sea. And he was talking about the problem of attaching the blades to the hub on the wind turbines. And oh, wow. So you're right at, in the ocean, you've got a massive pylon and you're trying to get moving. And you've got this moving. big blade that you've got to sort of bring in and, and they've got something like 64 bolts that they have to line up and feed in. So the blade comes in, they've got to hold it, line the bolts up, push it in and then do all the bolts up. And he was While saying, you're on a moving ocean? Generally or? they're off a jack-up barge. Okay, so right. that, that bit's okay, okay, but the wind is the blowing wind. and so the blade's moving around... And these blades are up to 70 metres long. You know, they're not easy to hold still. And so they used to stop work at 12 knots wind strength. And, hey, they're windy areas where they're putting these things in. It's not like it's a place that's normally yep. calm. 12 knots sounds like so a light breeze. So they had a lot of downtime. You say, how do I hold these blades still? And I, you know, I said, oh, yeah, I think I've got a solution to that. Yeah. No. The tinker um, in mind yeah. starts kicking in. Yeah, there's well, WA is actually an incredibly innovative place, and one of the another company uh, in WA, Veeam, is building gyroscopic stabilizers for boats. Oh, right. Yeah, and you know, I know the guys from there, yep. and um, I figured that oh, maybe there's an opportunity to grab one of these boat stabilizers, and I don't have to do anything. You know, this invention comes by me simply grabbing that thing, putting yep. it on a a beam and making a, a stabiliser for wind turbine blades. Amazing. Yep. So, you know, I said, I've got a solution. How much will you pay for it? And he said, 300 grand. <laughs> Just off the top of his head. That was, yeah. <laughs> that was the beer talking. Yeah. Um, so I said, oh, this is definitely worth chasing. Yeah, so, right. um, yeah, I came back and I went and actually spoke to them mm -hmm. um, at Veeam and um, Paul Steinman, who's the develop and or the um, boss there. Um, <clears throat> being a friend, he explained all the problems naturally that, you know, and the challenges and everything. And it, all, it said, oh, there's got to be an easier way to do it than this. Yeah. Um, and so we put a few, we bought a little Lego system. Okay. A little Lego toy gyro. So, and I got the bike wheel and spun it and 
got out a few books and sort of read up on the theory of it. So what was yeah. the point of getting the Lego out? Just sort of demonstrate there the There was a Lego concept. gyro kit you can buy. Okay. But it wears out the batteries in about 30 seconds. Really? So we went through about six packs of batteries <laughs> and I threw it out. We've still got it out at um, our factory. It's sort of oh, on wow. the display cool. pieces. Yeah. This was our first attempt. <laughs> um, so we started out with a gyro, then, you know, put some maths on it. Uh, and we worked out that it, it was a challenging way of doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and for what I wanted to do, I couldn't see that it was possible even to, to have it perform, um, to provide a continuous force to hold something against the wind. Yeah, okay. It didn't have that capability. But it was a start. But it was a start. The, down and the so process. then I was talking to someone and actually one of the, someone actually just mentioned, you know, well, a flywheel might even be better mm. to use. Mm. And then I thought, yeah, but that spins up and won't do the same thing. Then I thought, oh, maybe a fan, maybe a flywheel and a fan. That's not, no one's ever done that before. Yeah, okay. So it, it really just evolved from, yep. um, it wasn't like a light bulb moment where it happened all at once, but it was like, like let's process. try this thing, this won't work and why. So once you understand why it won't work, you then look for the bit that solves the part that won't work. Yep, yep. So that sounds like the satisfying thing when you start chipping away at, yeah. at taking a step at a time towards a solution. Yeah. yeah, and the thing is we didn't even know what forces you needed and all that sort of thing. So first thing was to try and work out what the problem was, you know, the, the, the scale. Mm-hmm. What, what sort of forces do you need? How often do, do you need to push it and pull it and how big are the batteries going to have to be? So the, it was completely unknown. Right Did you end up solving the problem? Yeah. For the, so you've got a turbine? Uh, oh, we haven't got wind turbines turbine. yet. Yep. yep. But we've got a solution on paper that, that can do it. So cool. uh, to build one is going to cost us around half a million dollars. So we're, f- we're trying to find someone who's going to use it if we build a prototype. Does the office still stand there for the 300 grand? <laughs> You'd make a 200 grand loss. <laughs> the thing is, it's more important than to probably discuss this. The, everything we do, we try and actually line someone up to be a partner. So at the moment we're talking to a whole bunch of people to try and be a partner so that once we develop it, they can actually test it and say, yeah, hey, it works well or yep. you need to improve this because that's just an absolutely essential part of the development. So that wind to- turbine problem was the start of you being aware of this you know, yeah. kind of crane-type movement space. How did that evolve into what you're doing at yeah, the moment? Yeah, so then we said, right, oh, we've got a... You don't start building something that's going to cost you half a million dollars for your prototype. Yeah, okay. You start building a little model, like a Lego model. And yep. We started with, you know, eBay was our, our best friend sort of thing with the kit. Yeah, right. um, Chinese stuff, un- unbranded Chinese equipment from eBay. Yeah, like, to, to get, to try get something moving, mm-hmm. very small. Mm-hmm. And so once we had some small kit, we said, well, what are we lifted on? We'll go out and try and lift some steel beams. Okay. So then we said, oh, actually... Yeah, the construction industry could use this, couldn't they? Nice, okay. So then, so you almost had a solution and you started looking around for... for so at that stage, it was like then a solution, Yeah. how can we use it? Yeah. Um, and we thought, oh, yeah, this will hold the beam still. Then we went and saw Multiplex. Mm-hmm. Uh, I spoke to a few of my friends who are in the building industry. Okay. Um, and Multiplex came and had a look at it and, yeah, we gave them a demonstration. It didn't work. But oh, no. What happened? <laughs> um, various things. Um, it, it's probably a bit technical, yeah, but we okay, didn't have enough. a swivel in. And when it sits on the side, it, it won't rotate. But it's it. the perils of the it, live it, demo. It, it could rotate it probably plus or minus 45 degrees, mm-hmm. but not 360. Okay. Yep. So, but the fact that it could ro- rotate at the 45 degrees showed everyone that the technology works it just needs one thing fixed up yeah wow yep so multiplex said yeah this has got legs on it you know and actually if you can do this with a remote control then people don't need to be near it this is a great safety okay. great safety benefit yeah oh okay so now we've got something that's a safety <laughs> device not so much a uh, productivity device. So just for context, explain what the safety issues are. So the safety the thing is that normally when you're uh, controlling a load in the air, yeah. it has a rope attached to it. Mm. So the guy stands underneath with a rope pulling it around. So he's at the mercy of 
something above his head. Yeah, scary. Um, yeah. They all say they don't stand underneath the load. I don't understand how a rope can be grabbed without yep. being underneath the load. Yeah, yeah. No. But basically, you're either under the load or under the crane boom. Yep. And as often as load's falling, you have crane booms falling. So scary. just being in that area isn't necessarily a very safe area. To yeah, be. so that's called the dog. The dogging? dogman, dogman, dogman. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And he's trying to grab a strap, which is maybe flapping around in the wind, and the load might you be. You grab a rope, and, and if the wind's blowing, the loads at the ropes at forty-five degrees, and so they lower the load over there so he can grab it. Then they bring it back up, and yeah. then he yeah. has to walk upwind and around it to turn it around. It's a really Pretty cumbersome dangerous. process, and if you've got stuff on the ground, mm-hmm. well, if you can actually walk around there, you're lucky. But yep. quite often, you can't even walk because you're on the top of a building or hanging out the end of a, edge of a building trying to rotate something. So. Yeah. And so here in Perth and in a lot of Australian cities, there's always a perpetual, you see the cranes on the skyline, you know, there's always a lot of development happening here. So how did you find, so you, you had obviously industry connections, which was super useful, but how did you find that first sales process? Well, the good thing was multiplex. Mm. Um, and really it's just a personal connection. You know, the, yeah. uh, Makes big turned out the boss was... Um, his son and my son were in the same class at school together. Oh, there you go. So, you know, big that, help. Yep. that's where it starts. Mm-hmm. So, so there's that personal, so that relationship selling, yeah. I guess, early on. Yeah. Yep. So talking to him down at the rowing and saying, hey, yep. if I had something that did this, would that sound interesting? Yep. And, so, you know. Nice. Yeah, yeah, so come and have a customers. chat. Yeah. And so how do you... Beyond the initial kind of pilot, I guess you know, on one site, how do you? What's the next step beyond that? How do you turn that into a business? So then we then we um, said, righto. Well, how about if we achieve, if we get it working and achieve this sort of performance, mm-hmm. would you pay some money? Okay, there you go. And yes, okay. Yep. So back of an envelope agreement, mm-hmm. and then similar sort of thing with Woodside. Okay, great. So we're already doing work for Woodside, for the yep. oil and gas side, and yep. you know there were people in Woodside who took an interest as well. So we had those two foundation development partners. Yep. Um, and they're brilliant. Amazing. You know, obviously Multiplex being one of the biggest construction companies around. Yeah. Um, you know, can use it in every city in Australia. Yep. So it was good. I think, you know, just thinking about this from other founders' point of view where that – relationship side of things might be more difficult or they might not necessarily have those connections what what advice can you offer them for how to get those early sales when it relies on a relationship or i'd say if you can't get a relationship you might as well give up wow yeah okay i think it is that that important important. yeah yeah makes sense i mean really when especially when you're talking business to business it's based on trust yep and you know how do you earn trust well you get to know somebody and you get you know learn learn about them and so you're right it's um and it's a it's a tough thing to do from a standing yeah, start yeah marketing yep. you know you're actually not appealing to someone's computer you're actually appealing to a person absolutely and yep. the same sort of thing you have to have a relationship with a company and yeah um offer them something that they want awesome. that, that benefits them yeah and, if, and and as a founder early on as well it's you that's doing that too you can't you can't outsource that necessarily um you know you shouldn't you know, you wouldn't go off at the bat and start hiring a sales team to to do those early initial I sales. I wish you for could you. remove the word early on. You know, um, yeah. it never ends. It actually <laughs> becomes more and more important. Um, yeah. What happens is that you still have to make the inroads because we're expanding overseas, and so mm-hmm. setting up agencies in in the UK, Europe, Japan, North mm-hmm. America. Each That's one it. of those sort of requires. What's the word? You've got to just work through your network yep. to find a link and and then gradually you'll get into those areas. Yep, finding through, people through who can introduce you to... Someone yep. will introduce you, yeah. Yeah. You know, yep. it's, it's not really cold call LinkedIn stuff. It's usually a network of someone who knows someone and you know, once, you're, once you get a, a contact... Yep. Um, yep. You're home and host. Yeah, it's just using that, that, that network effect. Yep. Yeah, for sure. So you've so you've built something essentially from scratch that didn't exist before. You've got those early customers. What's next? How do you how do you sort of scale that into you know build a team around it and turn that into a business on its own? Um, so you build a prototype, mm-hmm. and then 
from the prototype you then build three or four units. So there are then you have your tri- I, I sort of say your trial customers. So yep. in our case, we had Multiplex was our prototype. We spend about a year with them going through testing off site. Yep. We then put it on the Perth Museum site for probably seven months. And then they said, right, okay, let's start moving it to other sites in New South Wales. And I assume you were collecting feedback and learning how the, oh, the, it was used on site and things. How, how important yeah, that, was that? Oh, it hugely modified by the time it got to that second version of it. Yeah. And then at that stage we then were looking at a, the third version of it. So you just keep on iterating. Um, and I know data is very really important for for you guys as well. How do you sort of capture that? What do you do? With so we started out sort of, you know, with electronics, um, we are getting bugs and problems and, and things not working mm-hmm. and we just realised very early on that if we didn't have telemetry coming back and logging all the sensors, all the temperatures, speeds, currents yep. happening, we, we couldn't debug it. Wow. So we it's virtually a live feed of data that comes yeah, out. Yeah, so it's that. just wow. like, you know, you see the space program, you, yep. you know, you see every parameter we've got, the same thing. Wow. We reali- realised if we didn't have that, we couldn't debug it. Yeah. You'd be and guessing. so we put that in entirely for our own use in debugging. And then once you've got that data feed, you go, well, okay, we can actually um, do a video feed. And uh, actually we can show the customer this video feed. We just don't give them all the sensor data. They just, all they want to see is the weight and the video and the GPS position. We'll throw that on. So basically it started out with stuff that we needed. Yep. And then we said we can got we've got some useful information for the customer, and it's it's evolved from that really, and you know probably stuff that you haven't even seen. We've got our next stage is robo logistics, and oh, we're wow. just about to launch that. Very exciting. So it's a it's a complete logistics management package, but oh, wow. it's built on the ability to collect a lot of data that's location, um, image location, weight, image of the load and AI to sort of recognise what the load is and identify QR codes, etc., cetera, uh, and search by colour. You know, oh. Basically a really powerful logistics tool that Super exciting. isn't simply type in your tracking number and see when someone last scanned it. It's so great to see a company who's in a traditional industry really and probably a pretty old school and conservative one uh, using the technology that we've got at our disposal to make things safer, faster, more efficient. Um, you know, I think that's you know massive um, reason for your success is you know there's not that that many in this space doing that. So the the challenge really though is that we bring that information into an industry that's not used to using that data no. or not used to having the data, yeah. let alone using it. Yeah. So when you present them with a list of everything they've lifted. And it's got by date, time, weight, how long it took to lift. It's like, well, what do I do with this? This is almost too much information. Maybe, like death by data. Not, it's not that. It's like, well, what am I going to do with it? Yeah, um, and right. you go, well, if you want to change your business, what's the pain? What are the pain points? You know, what's mm-hmm. causing you a delay? Or you know, you're trying to do a cycle every eleven days. Yeah. Why don't you tr- what? What was stopping you from doing it every 10 days? Yeah. Yeah, For instance, cool. you know, That's and you a, go, yeah. well, you just can't do it. Really, you, you've got to go and analyse. You've got to analyse all your cycle times and everything and say, well, you know, what would I do differently? And, and if you haven't got that information of what the cycle times are and what things you think you could change, then it's really hard to change your processes. Yeah, and what... Gets measured, gets improved as well, I suppose. Yeah, oh, so, yeah. you've yeah. seen that a thousand yeah. times. You can't measure it, you can't improve it, yeah. What are some of the challenges you have with the adoption on site? I mean, you've got these construction workers, crane operators, dogmen, used to doing things a certain way. What's that like? They're very big challenges. We've had guys who we give a remote control and it goes in the back pocket, yeah, never to be seen again, not <laughs> used. So they just ignore it? They just ignore it. Yeah. So that's... Not uncommon, I'd say reasonably common. Wow. People who just will not will not use it. Yep. Um, so the challenge is really, you know, but what's in it for them? Yeah, that's, okay. That's probably the biggest issue. 
there's not a lot in it for old people mm-hmm. who are done things a certain way their whole lives. Who have done it this way their li- all their lives. You know, yep. some young people, young guys get a, a kick out of the new technology and hey, look what this can oh, do. Yeah, yeah. You know, isn't this cool? Yeah. So there are people who just love it because they're actually enjoying the new technology, and so that's what excites them. Yep. But the pe- those people who use it, do they get paid any more? No. Yep. You know, so do they get a pat on the back or anything? Probably not. Yeah. Okay. So it's a challenge. One of the challenges is what's in it for them. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So you got it. Uh, and we don't have control on that. Yeah, that's up to the customer, I suppose. That's to push the, that. Yep. Their company has to basically embrace that from the top down say right oh well if you actually it's almost a cultural change isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. If, if you if you run a safer site and you reliably hit your construction targets instead of being delayed by wind or whatever mm-hmm. um we'll uh take you on a holiday to rock nest or something <laughs> you know Weird Growth is sponsored by Ammo Marketing. In fact, we're recording the episode here in our offices right now. If you're interested in growth marketing for innovative businesses or even just checking out what we do, please visit ammo.marketing and have a little look around. Thanks so much. Let's get back to this amazing episode. I bet you've I bet you've seen some things and had some stories from you know people on site, you know, giving a little bit of pushback. Yeah, we um there was one location up in the northwest where yeah. we were doing a demonstration and um, the start of the demonstration, I walked into the all the riggers were sitting at the mess table in the lunchroom, and <laughs> they looked up and said, "You're the dickhead who's going to come along with that kit that's going to take our jobs away." <laughs> oh no! <laughs> and I said to myself, "This day is not going to go well." <laughs> oh, <laughs> especially out in the out in the and, Pilbara, and uh, yeah, in the Pilbara, yeah. and. Um, there was pushback. Yeah. Those guys wouldn't operate it because they said we haven't been trained, and then they said, "Oh, it hasn't got a some paperwork thing oh, or yeah. whatever." Or and an then um, it has a hook underneath it, and you have you have to reach that far under to put okay. something on the hook. Yeah, I'm not prepared to put my hand under a load. Mm. Which they do all the time anyway with the... I can stand the under the load with a rope. Yeah, right. I can't put my hand under a load to put the, yep. the rope on a hook. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it was, it, was, there was, it was just pushback. And I think, yeah, just fear about every step of the way with any new technology... Fear there's of losing their job. Yeah. Yeah. It's understandable. Yep. But, so moving on a little bit, Robo Rigger is now VC... Backed, you had Blackbird come on board last year. Um, oh, 2019. Is that? Oh, sorry, it was a couple COVID, of years ago. Yeah, yeah time right. Time flies. How, how have you found that investment process, and 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 why was it necessary? Um, the I could see that this was bigger than Ben Hur. You know, really, we've I've developed a lot of products in my time mm-hmm. that we could sell to six drilling companies or whatever. This one, we can sell. Hundreds, if not thousands. Global implications. Global. It's got. It's global. It can go go wild. Yeah. So you can't go wild with, uh, what's the word? Um, organic growth. Yeah. So I mean, in, in sort of tech startup language, I suppose it's bootstrapping, mm. which makes sense often with software. But when you've got hardware and big pieces of equipment and factories and warehouses, I suppose that's a different kettle of fish. Yeah, you've got to build different units for different countries. You've got to get mm-hmm. certification. You've got to get units over there. You've got to have training. You know, there's a lot of infrastructure. I always say you know, it's 25% to get the prototype right and have built and I actually have the product finished and the other 75% is getting it to market. Yeah. So yeah. I... I, I Went in there with an understanding of, of what that cha- that that challenge is really big. Yep. And yep. basically, there's always a time window. You know, you you can put a patent on something, but there are other ways of doing the Someone same will job. Copy it eventually. Yeah. And you know, maybe not quite as well, but it could still be a product that does does the job. Yep. So it made sense for you. So in your case, a VC investment because it accelerate your growth. And yeah. you could sort of develop the hardware side of things uh, faster without having to wait for the, for the bootstrapping. 
what was the process like? Did you find, I mean, you're a practical engineer, you know, guy who's always built things physically. What was that like pitching to investors? So I started out talking to a few companies in Perth Mm -hmm. and I found it was a bit like I was selling snake oil. Um, You know, I think they're used to mining companies saying, I've got the mother load there, I've walked on it, I can smell there's gold. Yeah, Um, there's a tenement out in the middle of the desert somewhere. It's in the middle of the desert. I just got to drill it just to find out. I drill it, but it's definitely going to be there, give me the money, and it pays back in three weeks. Yeah. Um, that's the way investments always worked in and Australia. Yeah, yes. and that's that's sort of the, the model that people had used here. And so when you went over, when I went into them and said, right, we've got something here that will pay back in two to three years and then really there's a growth opportunity that, you know, it, it'll go ballistic yep. after that. Yeah. They go, what? It won't pay back in three weeks? <laughs> five times over? Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, then that this thing's a complete not, dog. Right. Go away. You're not even interested in talking to. And by the way, you haven't got it up and running. And what's your cash flow? Yep. And, and what's your profitability in the last six months? In other words, so all questions that aren't relevant to a, a startup. Tech, te- yeah, tech startup. Yeah. 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 So really, I got the feeling they had no idea. Yeah. They were in a they were in a different field altogether. Yeah. So yeah. I was I was wasting my time talking to them. Yeah. So you needed someone who had the mentality of that. An and understanding of how they... Once again, father of another school, friend of my son's... Oh, really? Yeah. Um, just said, oh, you know, I've heard... Of, I know about Blackbird. Do you want me to introduce you? Yep. Wow. So Blackbird is introduction only, sort of, the way they yeah. try and work. Yeah. Um, but they're probably one of the more respected VC firms yeah. in, in Australia, yeah. So... When it comes to startups start- start- particularly. When it comes down to it, you know, I went and spoke to them... Um, because we we're doing work with Multiplex in Sydney, mm-hmm. you no, know, very convenient to just drop in for coffee. Mm-hmm. So I just dropped in over you know six months. I probably dropped in twice, and then six months later, I said, "Oh, look, you know, I'm thinking about now raising some money." Yep, they knew me. Yep. Um, Again, relationship. So yeah, eventually, yeah. Yep. So we had a coffee. They knew the product. They'd been following it a bit too. Um, and it was working in Sydney, so you know we're at the stage then when we actually had a real product. Yeah, we had real. Cu- we had tier one customers, Multiplex and Woodside. Yep, and they could see the potential. I suppose, and they could speak to them. They mm-hmm. did speak to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so who else did I go to? Actually, no one. Yeah, um, wow, that's believe it or not, incredible. Yeah. So you could say that's slack, but I'll say I've been in business long enough to know. When you're dealing with someone who's just straight up and down, yeah, honest, yeah. and you know the deal was as good as or better than I thought I could get, yeah, right. Um, don't bother looking further. What has it meant for Robo Rigger that you've had that cash injection? Oh, it's essential. Yeah, you know we're burning through it. Yeah. Um, you're talking about global expansion and how oh, does that... Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. You know, we've got a factory going and we've got European certification and we've got units in Europe and Japan. Oh, wow. And, you know, we're sending units to America for, yep. for January. We've got New Zealand. So how would we do that without it? You couldn't. Yeah, yeah, that's exciting. So it's really cranky up. it's allowed us to do all of that and develop new designs. Um, to get a design, you know, there's a big difference between... You've probably heard Elon Musk say you can get a build a rocket prototype, but mm-hmm. to actually learn how to, to produce one, mm-hmm. mass produce one, yep. is, a, is, what did you say, 10 or 100 times harder. Yeah, and I think that's what they found with the Tesla vehicles as well. Yeah, that's and, the, and it's that's the same the thing with us. You know, Building the prototype is okay, yep. but then when you try and actually build a production version of consistently, it, yep. consistently with proper quality control and everything, completely different. Wow. Yeah. And you're making them here in Australia? In in Perth, in yeah. In Perth, yeah. That's so setting cool. up systems, you know, you need to have basically aircrafts manufacture quality standards wow. in terms of traceability of materials, you know, and records and testing records and stuff like that. So you can't set, you know, it's not cheap to set that up. And is there a reason that you're doing that in Australia rather than what everyone else does and build it in China? Um, we get components in from China. Yep. You know, we get sort of... 
can't build everything from scratch from a chunk no, of stick. No, yeah. Um, I just figure that if we, if all our people who are involved in the design still struggle to get everything to be a hundred percent perfect, how challenging will it would it be for someone else? Yeah, right. Super complex. So until we've actually got a design that I think that that we can build blindfold and achieve, we've got procedures and componentry that's hundred percent sure. Yeah. Um, don't even think of building it overseas. Yeah, makes total sense. Perfect. You could build process, overseas yeah. with the bits that we know that we have problems that you'd have problems with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, being sent from Australia as kits. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That that would be possible, but uh, definitely um, don't leave the sort of uh, anything that has design work or thinking about how to do stuff uh, overseas. That's you, you, the value that you can create. That's yeah, the value yeah. we've yeah. created. Yeah. Well, extremely exciting that you're scaling internationally, you're selling overseas into you know America and Japan and Europe. That's awesome. But what could possibly be next for the future? You're talking about the logistics stuff. Yeah, Robo so, Logistics yeah. is a How really good one. It's, yeah. um, for instance, yeah, we've got a camera on Robo, camera load cell, which measures the weight of the load, and a GPS. Okay. And so every time we do a lift, we record to the internet a line of data which says, this, at this time I lifted this load and here's a photo of it and here's the GPS position. And then we can get, a, we get logs of, you know, you lifted X number of loads today, average interval between loads was Y, all this sort of stuff. And so we said, well, this is really useful. It tells you about the productivity of what you're doing. Yeah. What about actually looking at what you're actually lifting and saying, well, it tells me that what's arrived and when stuff has arrived on site, when stuff has left site. And we get, yeah, okay, it's really good for that, but sometimes stuff arrives by truck and they lift it off the forklift. Oh, right. So and can't. everything isn't lifted with a robo rigger. And say the truck is loaded with a forklift at the uh, supplier's site. So I said, okay, well, what if we could capture that loading operation mm-hmm. on the forklift and the offloading, whether it be by forklift or robo rigger, we've then got full traceability of where the equipment is coming to site, when it's been loaded on the truck, and then if you could follow the truck, you know, you know exactly where all your stuff wow. is. And so it's a complete got picture, a, yeah. Yeah, if you've got a busy construction site, you can schedule your trucks because you know what's on them, where they are, and you can see that they've got the right stuff on. Um even more so when you're doing something like a shutdown at a, or a project on a remote mine site, you send a whole lot of equipment and tools and materials up over, say, two weeks prior to the shutdown. Yep. And it's all in a big yard, a kilometre by a kilometre somewhere. Oh, wow. And Just you hope piles it's of stuff. all arrived. <laughs> yeah, uh, wow. Generally, you send someone up there yep. for those, those two weeks and they walk around and they you hope that they can sort of... Check every, that everything you wanted to be there is there. Just spend um, weeks walking around eyeballing everything. They eyeball yeah, everything wow. and, yeah. and they don't know every bit of kit that's going to arrive. So they'll sort of look at something and they'll go, oh, that's a box for Derek, but I don't know. It's got some steel in it. I don't know what it is. But, you know, I know what it is. And if you could send me a photo of it, yep. I'll tell you whether that's the bit I need. Yeah. <laughs> And so what you want to have is you want to have records of where everything that you sent, A, that it's arrived, and B, yep. whereabouts in this yard is, is it, and in, is it in good condition, or has someone opened the box and taken half of the stuff away? Yep. Has stuff fallen off the pallet? All that sort of thing. Yeah, right. So we figured that if we could track all of that, that would be... And because I've come from a background of working on offshore oil fields mm-hmm. uh, and up in the northwest, mm-hmm. you know, I'm... Yeah, it's, great it's, position. It's a problem that I have had. But also, you know, you've you've created this technology from a hardware sense, and then bridging the gap and and getting that sort of inside line into understanding how important the data is and the understanding for how um, materials flow and everything. You're getting that really amazing insight into all the challenges that those companies face, and building the relationships with them and earning that trust. Mm. It's it's ideal to be able to sell so, that stuff. So it's a roll it? on from, from Robo Rigger. Yeah. And yeah. then we Imagine. said, well, actually our forklift, we, when we are building Robo Riggers, we are sending them out 
And every now and again we go, well, did that go out on Thursday or Friday? You know, when do we start billing the, the customer? Yeah, yep. Um, Should oh, be when it I'll go back or? and get the re- the paper records out. Yeah. yeah. Or something <laughs> like that. And you go, wait a minute, wouldn't it be great if we just had a photo of everything that's come in and yep. everything that's come out? Magic. Gone out. So oh, we yeah. sort of, we've, we've built it around that system to using our existing data, um, AWS cloud database, mm-hmm that captures all that data. So we yep. didn't have to reinvent that bit. Um, we great. simply had to capture data on a forklift with a very user-friendly interface. Yep. And then we sort of worked out, well, if we structured it properly, we could actually make it work for a, a transport company, a logistics company, a single company receiving stuff yeah. themselves, Amazing. a mining company. So we've, we've structured so that it's... There's going to be no operating manual. Yep. So it'll just um, be intuitive It's got within to be itself. intuitive. Yeah. Uh, there's no... You'll learn that if you swipe to the right sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Is it will have a note which says, if you want to do that, swipe to the right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm a bit old school there. <laughs> um, so in other words, everything you have to do is intuitive from the screen yeah, that awesome. you're on. Yeah. That's what people expect, I think, in you know their user interfaces these days. So that sounds awesome. What's one big piece of advice that you have for founders who are, who are looking to grow? Well, I think I said it early on. Yeah. You've got to have a development partner. Yes. Um, I think that's probably one of the, the most important things. So by that you mean potentially a, an early customer? Early customer. Who work with, try and work with a customer. Yeah. Um, the Not only for getting money in the door, but reference site. Yeah. So the best way of selling, in my opinion, is ring one of our customers and they can tell you what they think of it. That's the best form of marketing there is, is what other people, yeah. ha- happy customers say yeah. about you. Yep. Get a happy customer to just tell you how good it is. Yep. You can say everything you like about yourself, but it's never going to be as legitimate or yeah. powerful as what someone else can say. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, something else we do on Weird Growth is a little bit of show and tell. And what we ask is, is there a favourite tool or device or something which makes your life better that you that you want to share? I think there are two things that I'm obsessive about. Yeah. One is Google Earth. Oh, yeah, I love Google Earth. Yeah. And and I seem to use it a lot more than most people. I um, Particularly if we're going overseas to customers uh, or we're checking out service agents. Yep. You know, I feel like I'm a... A spy, you know, (laughs) you you check out their factory, you zoom in, you sort of see what's street view. It's pretty amazing. What's the the appearance of their site, you know, how's their advertising on the the billboard at the front? Yep. Um, What's in their yard at the back? You know, what else are they working on? So you'll see something outside parked there. Will Google Earth give you the sort of three-quarter angle views or was that... Some of it's got everything, yeah. yeah. So depending on where you are... Yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes you can get those angles and incredible. There's an amazing amount of information. If they've got the garage door open at the front, you can sort of get a peek inside and <laughs> see what they're they're working on. So it's a bit like a spy cam, I yeah. know. It, but yeah. I, I think that there's just so, so much amazing information you can get from that. Yep. And also discovering places that you're never gonna get to. For sure. Yeah, it's pretty incredible to think that wasn't very long ago the, the extent of what you had was a map book basically yeah uh, yeah it's awesome and the other thing i'm probably uh, i'm pretty um fascinated by elon musk and what he's doing mm-hmm. and has done yep um i just like the way the stories that he tells are so similar to ours just that he's got three extra noughts or four extra noughts or six <laughs> extra noughts on the end of it um, oh, you'll get there one day. <laughs> they're the same sort of things about you know building prototypes um, that didn't work. Yeah. Um, but you had to build it yeah. uh, and try it out and discover something that, oh, yeah, of course we should have done that. Because it's that um, learning process that's so critical to de- developing any innovation, I suppose. How yeah. quickly can you learn lessons? There's some stuff that, you know, if you can't test it, you have to actually go through the... Uh, design sort of process and look at it on computer models and 
sit around and think of all the things that could go wrong. Yep. Um, but other things that you can build it and trial it out and measure it and learn from the practical. Um, and and I always say never underestimate learning from the practical. You know, cardboard models, string, sticky tape, absolutely invaluable. Awesome. We'll have to find ways to get some arts and crafts into our digital marketing <laughs> process here because it is. There's something, yeah, there's something uh, just different about having a tangible object to manipulate um, which gives you a different way of thinking about things. Some, well, sometimes you just don't understand it properly. Yeah. You know, it's quite amazing when you hang something on a piece of string and you sort of push it that way and yeah. you might think it sort of swings that way but it actually sort of swings that way right. or whatever. Yeah, you know, yeah, of course yeah. it does. But yeah. if you can make a cardboard model, you'll avoid the pitfall of That's quite cool. um, yeah. getting it wrong. Um, just on Elon Musk, my favourite book is actually one that, that Jack – bought for me called Space Barons. I don't know if you've read that I one. I read it, no. But that's about the almost the sort of billionaire space yeah. race between, you know, um, you know, Elon Musk and Eric Schmidt and uh, Jeff Bezos. Um, and, you know, they actually do drive each other forward in terms of the competition yeah. that they have amongst each other. And the awesome story that I sort of always think of is when Elon Musk, after he sold PayPal and started SpaceX, he had their rocket program based out of, I think, Guam? Or they were using some yeah. sort of one of the missile yeah. fields out in the in the Pacific with the U.S. military, and they were just blowing up rockets. Yeah. And there was there was so little um, progress that they were really making. And I think they'd blown up virtually their last rocket. And he was down to his last pennies essentially, uh, and they had one last chance. Um, and he had to borrow money even after you know making millions and millions out of PayPal. Um, and it's just such an incredible story of someone who really believed in what they were doing and he you know was happy to risk everything to make it happen it's really incredible. i think the good thing is that he actually understands it too I, you know like i don't think you could ask jeff bezos about yeah true. rocketry and he'd be able to tell you the he's you just know, feeding the, the money. momentum equations and stuff like that elon musk is definitely an engineer first he's and an engineer first second. and so that you know like a bill gates he bill gates sort of understood would probably be able to tell you how Excel worked in the yep. back end of it. Yeah, yep. Um, yep. Elon can tell you how his rockets work. Yep. You know, and I can tell you how Robo Rigger works. There you yeah. go. Well, the technical Same founder thing. is yeah. often, you know, going to have a lot better run it. That's awesome. Um, do you have a final plug or an, or an ask, or what would you like people to do if they're interested in finding out more? Oh, look, we've got a website, obviously. Yeah. Yep. Um, and keep monitoring it because we've, we're about to. Uh, Launch Robo Logistics, and Love it. we're running a European roadshow. We've just oh. got our first unit sold in Europe. Um, we're going to have one in in Toronto in January. Um, so you're getting on a plane, or is it all kind of hard at the moment? Isn't it? I think I've got to be polite to our WA politicians. <laughs> yeah. I, I, um, I do think that we could run this very differently, so that we could be. Great. Able to interact with the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, you cannot do business with the rest of the world on Zoom. You can maintain relationships, but I don't believe you can create new relationships yeah. properly. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah. That is the real challenge. And I think... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, jump, jump, jump on his jet. Has he ever done quarantine? Do you know? No, I don't know. I do think that for Western Australia, at least, we need to have some certainty. There needs to be a date that... At the moment, everything seems very fuzzy. Uh, that you know, we've got an eighty to ninety percent target, and we've got a maybe in eight, March or April. And I don't think that's conducive to doing to doing business. Hundred percent target and compulsory. Yeah, a compulsory. If you want to be, if you want to live in a cave, you can not vaccinate. Well, but other than that, if you want to be part of us, you've got to be vaccinated, and you got four weeks to do it, guys. Yep. Yeah, well, we've had plenty of opportunity, right? Jack had his you know, number two the other day, didn't you? Are you still feeling all right? How's your five G reception? One means you're on the on the road. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing I didn't mention was yeah. that um, in Japan, we're starting, we're just starting the trials of the world's first fully autonomous crane. Wow, Robo Crane. Wow. So, the, our development partner, I can't mention their name. Yep. Um, has is is a construction company and they've got the crane working from a 
remote control desk and robo rigger is controlled in also controlled from that desk wow so Incredible. um so yeah, gone are the days of the of the guy sitting up in the potentially in the in the co- oh, cockpit absolutely. up on the top of absolutely. the crane and, yeah, and, and climbing up a ladder fully precast building so they're building a 16 story building fully precast holy moly and they're at level 6 now wow so it's it's, it's not working. this is going this is happening wow at the moment well, congratulations That's so uh, some really interesting stuff like that and yeah. you know obviously um, there's a few learning lessons we're learning on the the first week of implementation Good but time. um yeah you know, i imagine in 3 to 4 weeks we'll have this working quite smoothly that's really exciting Derek yeah, yeah. so it's good Mate, thank you so much for being on Weird Growth. Um, really appreciate your experience and insights and that technical angle to, to what you've done and the you know explaining you know the process with innovation has been really fascinating. So thank you so much. Thanks, Cam. I've enjoyed being here. Yeah, no, it's been a great chat. Um, and thank you for listening to Weird Growth. Um, if you enjoyed the episode, please do subscribe on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. Um, and if you're listening to this on a podcast. This is also available on YouTube as a video. So jump on YouTube, subscribe to the channel and leave a review if you found this helpful or interesting. Um, But for now, that's all from us here at Weird Growth. I'm Cam Sinclair. Bye-bye. Weird Growth is brought to you by a new product from Ammo Marketing called MyFunnel. For early stage founders, it can be really hard to know what channels and tactics to use for your startup marketing. So we've built a free tool that generates a marketing funnel for your startup. Go to myfunnel.com.au, answer a few questions, and you'll have something in your inbox in five seconds. <laughs>